Yeah, happy Monday, everybody. How's it going? It's going well. Welcome, Kent. Hey, hey good to see you guys. Here. Yeah, good yeah. to see you too. How's it going? Very good. Very good. Nice cool. uh, breezy Monday morning here and in, uh, in Galveston on the island. Nice. It looks very. Uh, it looks looks pretty there. So. Oh, it is. It's, it's yeah. It's a, a great place to be. So even even when it was you know. 90 to 100 degrees this summer it was still pretty nice down here as long as you got a nice little ocean breeze and uh, some tropical uh beverages we're, we're good to go <laughs> that's awesome well cool um i guess for people who don't know who you are do you want to give a quick intro sure sure kent, kent graziano um also known as the data warrior uh, i've been in the it data space for over 40 years. Uh, most recently, I was the uh, chief technical evangelist for Snowflake. Uh, I did a six plus year stint with them. And uh, December last year, I kind of went into semi retirement, and, you know, take take a little break and um, in, in, enjoy the, as they say, the fruits of my labor and get to do fun things like uh, podcasts and a few cool. webinars here and there. And uh, and enjoy some time down here uh, in, in Galveston on the island and doing a little travel. Yeah, I remember your retirement announcement last year. Then, then all of a sudden I, I saw you were everywhere <laughs> uh, advising <laughs> companies on podcasts. It's like, I guess, uh, you know, Ken yeah, it was, retirement, but uh, it's cool. It's the, the classic. Yeah, I tried to get out and they pulled me back in. You know, I yeah, just yeah, yeah. <laughs> had too, too many requests to, to keep saying no. So what about the, the warrior yeah. part of Data Warrior? Tell us a bit about that. We were talking yeah. about that before the um, show. So I have been uh, a practitioner of traditional Taekwondo for 42 years. Nice. And I'm actually uh, now ranked as the eighth Dan black mm. belt and grandmaster of Taekwondo. Um, so uh, I founded a, a group up in Denver in the day called Rocky Mountain Taekwondo. And that's, that's my uh, association, if you will. And I still teach a couple times a week. Uh, e even now, I have uh, one or two students uh, still up in the Colorado area that uh, that practice. But yeah, I kind of combine the, the the two together. Of um, you know, my approach to data is with a what you consider a warrior mindset, very focused, you know, very very determined, um, trying to uh, to do what we need to do with data. And so yeah. It, uh, turned into it started out as the oracle data warrior uh, my my blog about uh well, what was that 12 years ago uh, my wife actually said you know you're gonna be an independent consultant which i was at the time you probably should have a blog and at that time i was working pretty exclusively in the oracle space so i called it the oracle data warrior and then um, my uh, friend and mentor claudia imhoff one day uh, was meeting with her and she said you know you need to drop the oracle thing because what you do uh, in talking about data models and architecture and all that, it applies regardless of technology. I mean, these are just good best practices in data management. So um, on her advice, I actually dropped the Oracle thing off and just became the data warrior. Man, and it has, has stuck all Apparently. through uh, <laughs> there. And, yes. <laughs> and, and into, uh, uh, into uh, my, my time at Snowflake as well. That's really cool. I mean, I, I've been doing uh, martial arts all my life as well. I mean, what, what is it about the warrior mindset that you find applies to data? I, I got my own uh, ideas on this, but I'd love to hear yours. Well, data it, warrior, so. and, and again, and I think, and I have this, uh, talk about this all the time, even with, you know, good data management requires discipline, right? And I think that's where we, we fall down in the industry and where you see these massive failures, right? And very, I always talk about the classic, you know, multi-million dollar data warehouse project that failed. And if you go and you investigate it, what you find out is there was no discipline, there was no rigor, it, you know, and you can have a massive team of people and still have it disciplined and still apply standards, still apply rigor. And I remember, you know, my, uh, my uh, grandmaster uh, was a, a student of the founder of Taekwondo. And he used to tell me about back in the day when he first came to America, he would teach a class with 150 people in it. You know, That's he would stand at the head of a class of a, a class of, uh, of Taekwondo students, you know, 150. You know, he did he would do black belt seminars that had that had a couple hundred black belts in it. Wow. And 
he said, you know, you know, line everybody up and you have a, he had a standard way of approaching how he taught, which he taught me and uh, it worked, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't a lot of, you know, there's some wiggle room and everything, right? But it was, you know, very structured. I mean, martial art, they really come from military, right? And there's a certain discipline involved in, in, the, in the military and applying that mindset to really anything, whether it's data or not, right? Any, any type of uh, career vocation, I'll call it, rather than a job, um, you can be very successful once you figure out the the pattern with which to be successful and and stick with that pattern and apply it and these days we call those things best practices right and that's um so i think that was there and then also the other thing in, in taekwondo one of our um you know two two of the tenets in taekwondo are perseverance and indomitable spirit right and that meant you know you just keeping at it yeah it might be a little painful but you work through it and you never give up if you believe in what you're doing and the goal you're trying to achieve you 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 just never give up that's really cool yeah sorry about what you say? this oh I, I was gonna ask this question so is it possible can we decentralize <clears throat> discipline and i think this lines up very much with the data math conversation and it's something that joe and i thought about a lot when we were writing our book I think the, the old school enterprise mentality is that discipline is very centralized, right? So you have to have central committees that make decisions together. And I think the ideal from our perspective is that you have discipline, but maybe it's a little more distributed, like people can work collaboratively instead. Right. And, and I think that, that it is absolutely possible. I mean, we'll keep in with the, 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 the Taekwondo motif. I had senior instructors who basically reported to me. And if I had a large class, I never got to the point where I could run a couple hundred people like my, my grandmaster could, but I could have, you know, a half dozen other black belts and divide the class up. Right. And, you know, you take the yellow belts, you take the white belts, you take the blue belts, you take the red belts and still have a pattern to it. And, you know, it's now decentralized. We've got the different domains, if you will, uh, different levels of expertise and have a expert coach then working them through the routines and through the drills and whatever learnings they needed to do. And in, you know, when we talk about data mesh, one of the recommendations I've, you know, uh, made to people and found with some of the folks that I've worked with was to have a center of, back to that center of excellence concept, right? Is yes, uh, the, one of the goals of data mesh was to remove the IT bottleneck and like you said, and, and decentralize things and make it a little more collaborative. Well, if you're going to push things out, you can't expect everybody out there to be an expert. So how do you, then it becomes a question of how do you empower them? How do you mentor them? How do you coach them? Well, having maybe the IT realm that their role now is that center of excellence to figure out what some of the best practices are and you know where the variances can be to set some of the i'll say enterprise level standards but then go out into the people if you will right and and help them with it help them learn it uh bring them up to speed uh, help them find the right staff for for the domain rather than saying oh you know you got to send it all to us right we'll 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 figure it out for you no we don't want to do that we want to it's the it's back to the uh you know, teach, teach fish, right? And let them go do it themselves and let's teach them how to do it. And then you can have a, a very successful decentralized approach, but still with that overall governance that's necessary to for the organization to not get themselves in trouble by doing things with data that they shouldn't be doing. There's still gotta be some 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 rules around this. It's really interesting. I guess carrying on the martial arts analogy too, like how much do you do you feel like the the modern data world has become more like mixed martial arts than a, uh, a traditional <laughs> martial art? Well, uh, that's you know it, it has in many regards, and I think you know there's a and I've seen levels of success even in the mixed martial arts. Right? Mm -hmm. Is that you know if you if, if a traditionalist goes and participates in a mixed martial art competition, they usually get their butt kicked. Not a good day. Right? Not a good day, though. Every once in a while, you get someone who's really, really good, and, yeah. and it does go the other way because they happen to be really, really good at something, and they know how to execute it well, and their opponent doesn't understand. Right. Uh, 
but in the in in the data world, yeah, it's when we went through. I'll have to go back to uh, you know the big big data, NoSQL, schema unread, data lakes, and then data swamps. What we found out is, yeah, we tried to let you know, oh, just we'll just throw the data in there, and then everybody can have access to it, and that's what turned into the data swamp, right? So it it didn't have enough discipline. Now, honestly, today mixed martial arts schools have a lot of discipline, right? Mm -hmm. And those guys are the ones that are successful in the rank, right? The people that are just going, oh, you know, I dabble a little karate here, a little aikido there, a little tai chi here, and then I'm going to go compete. Well, those guys don't do so well. Right, because right. they never got the classic jack of all trades, master of none, right? And they never learned uh, necessarily learned the useful aspects of any of those individual martial arts to put them together into something that was going to be successful. And I think we we've, we've definitely see that in the data world, where you know there may be little or no data modeling on one team, and then yet another team may be you know doing dimensional models, another team mm -hmm. may be doing data vault models and other teams trying to do third null form models. Um, and you get varying degrees of success to, uh, on the individual teams, depending on the level of expertise of the people on those teams. But as an overall enterprise though, uh, and this is where I think, you know, the risk of data mesh is doing something like this, where people think, oh, it's decentralized and they take decentralized to mean basically it's a free for all. Right. Each team has a different set of tools. Each team is using whatever platform they want. One team's using Oracle, one's using Snowflake, one's using Cassandra, another one's using BigQuery. And then when it comes time though, at the enterprise level uh, to bring it all together, it's impossible, right? Because there's just, there's no easy way to do it. And the, uh, when Jamak, you know, presented all this uh, concept on data mesh, one of the keys to it was interoperability, yeah. right? Yes, we're going to keep the you know, we're going to keep the domains in charge of their own data. The people who know the data then are responsible for curating the data, which I think is the way it always should be, and have tried to do that all the time anyway. But if you don't have some level of standards, then how are you going to make those different pockets of data interoperable easily? Right, because you got to throw that. E if we want to be agile, if we want to be flexible. It has to be fairly easy to do and easy to navigate. And you know, you guys in um, all your discussions and work on data engineering, I'm sure you, you've seen that. Right, this is, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do it. But if you're dealing with a big organization, if everybody's doing it a different way, it's not going to be easy to pull the pull it together. And you can say there should be an API on everyone, but there's different ways of building APIs. And not every domain may have the expertise to access an API and understand how to pull the data from it. Um, so I think that's that's all there, and that's why I get back to I think you know some centralized level of discipline and standards is, is kind of important to be successful. Otherwise, you can have a data me mesh, as I said, that turns into a data mess that you've basically got data silos, right? And yeah. and absolutely, that's, Jamak is very clear on that. Yep. You know, that's what we're trying to, we're trying to avoid that, right? It's like, you know, we're, we don't wanna eliminate a quote unquote bottleneck in IT and replace it with a bunch of data marts because then we're back to where we were 20 years ago with federated data marts that actually couldn't be put together that you had, you know, each data mart had its own customer account. And then the CEO's going, well, how many customers do I have? And three different VPs give him three different answers. Well, okay, we, we definitely do not want to go there again because now what we've got is a, I'll say, semi-structured data lake almost, right? Where each thing is very independent, but it's so independent that it doesn't integrate. And yeah. again, you've got whether you want to call them data lakes, data ponds, data silos, that's not a data mesh and that's not the goal of a data mesh, right? She Todd has a comment here. So Todd, um, he says, this is interesting. So, uh, we want decentralized, but we want interop and standards, which seem at odds, uh, the gatekeeping versus governance debate continues. Well, any, any thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I mean, he, he's not wrong. I mean, uh, part of this is it's, it's, it's people and processes, right? More so even than technologies, but 
if you want to, I mean, it's one thing to say theoretically, okay, fine, domain team, just make sure your data is interoperable. Well, what does that mean? Right. And, and, and if you're pushing this out to a business team, right? So you're, say, going to the finance department, say, okay, finance, you're now responsible for all the finance data and you need to put it into a data product that's accessible by everybody and their brother that should have access. Okay. There, the next question is going to be, how do I do that? Right. That you just say, well, just make it interoperable. Well, that's, mm-hmm. that's not an answer. Right. And that doesn't, that's not helpful to that team. And that's why I think we still, there has to be governance. Um, you know, when they talk about federated governance in the data mesh world, that means, you know, it, it is governance at the domain level, but that doesn't mean that it's a willy nilly set of standards either. It just means that, okay, we know we have to enforce some privacy regulations. These are the rules. When you build your data product, you, the finance team, you need to determine how those privacy regulations are applied to the data so that when people are accessing the data, they only see the data they're supposed to see. Right. So there's, there's got to, there's still got to be some central level uh, of control, but not control. And, you know, he said gatekeeping, right? Uh, okay. Yeah. That's what we're trying to avoid, right? We don't want to have, um, a six week process to move something to production because there's one centralized committee of five people that have to approve what you did, right? Better the, you know, the finance team themselves says, okay, we here's the standards. We've applied the standards, right? Check, check, check. And it's got to become much more self-service and again, much more collaborative, as you said earlier uh, to do that, but it does still require some rules. Otherwise it is, it is a free for all. It's a melee, right? Throw everybody in the ring and go at it. Whoever's left standing at the end is the winner. <laughs> and I mean, I think it's fair to say too that this has always been a challenge for business, right? You get into any big business and you had to make sure that supply chain was coordinating with warehouse, was coordinating with finance, was coordinating with marketing. And if you didn't have that, it wasn't so much that you had a winner, you just had a bunch of losers like fighting with each other. And I think the problem that's yeah. happened in data is that from a technology standpoint, it used to be really, really hard to have like to get a big database or big MPP system, right? Like you'd have to go into Oracle, say, and sign a multi million dollar contract. And that's no longer the case. Like anyone on any team could theoretically just spin up a system like BigQuery in an hour. And that's really good and bad, right? I, mean, I think, Joe, we've seen it go both ways. Like, well, there's no coordination, it's bad. Well, what I've, what I've seen too is, and some, we talk a lot about Matt, but I think one of the missing links, and I had an article in my newsletter about this, but we focus a lot on the technology, but not as much on the people process part. And so what we're finding is standardization of skills and competency all over, all over the board, frankly. Like, it's not really standardized at all, um, even across a single data team. Um, I mean, if we if we chose data teams the way we chose maybe a Taekwondo team, for example, I, I think the team would be um, perform pretty badly, to be frank. Uh, it's like, oh, you can you can throw a roundhouse kick. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, you can, you can be on my team. Um, you can break <laughs> uh, five boards with your, with your head. That's 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 cool. You, you can join, too. All right. But it's but there's you know what, what we notice on data teams is um, it's about the equivalent. Right. Oh, you, you sort of understand how a database works. Um, um, you know, you can write SQL, cool, you can be on the team, right? But there's no standardization of skills. And so you start multiplying that by different data teams and, um, you know, different standards and so forth. And I, I think you can kind of see where that goes. You've seen where it goes, actually. Right. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's why it, it, in my the conversation always, for me, always t- rolls back to, you know, first data modeling is that you know, if we're going to share data, we need to have some agreed upon standard on how we're going to share that data and what it looks like. So then you look at, okay, well, are we going to do dimensional models? Let's have everybody do dimensional models. All right. Well then, okay. Then somebody's somewhere, somebody has got to be responsible for figuring out what the conform dimensions are. Mm-hmm. Um, or do we do data vault, right? Um, you know, data, data vault has the great capacity because it's such a granular level to model separate, subject areas but still allow them to be linked together and that you know seems to make a lot of sense to me from a data mesh perspective because it is a network right a, a data vault model if you look at it is really it's a bunch of hubs and links which means so you can have the customer data over here and the finance data over here but okay there's a relationship between those two that maybe neither domain really is responsible for but it's more of an enterprise thing so you can build a link to join those together and now you have a 
um, a language with which to interact between those data sets uh, that, that allows it to be built in a more incremental, agile way. But key to it is, and I've always said this with standards, is like, I don't care what standard you pick, just pick one, yep. right? Have a standard or a set of standards. And okay, obviously with different teams and different skill sets, you know, there might be a little leeway, but we need to still have some guidelines to say, this is, this is acceptable. These are, these are the best practices. Let us help you learn how to implement them. Right. And if it's, you know, if we're going to do dimensional modeling, let's make sure that there's one experienced modeler on each domain team. And if there isn't, then we talk about training. You know, does the center of excellence provide some training or do we send everybody off to uh, Kimball university? If we're going to do data vault, we send them off to be data vault certified. And that way, uh, when I first got into data vault, I took my entire team. I took the, the project mm -hmm. manager, the report analysts, the report writers, the ETL programmers and the DBAs. And we all went to the data vault class together because then that gave us a common language to work together as a cohesive team. Right. And everybody was able to understand what we were talking about. Um, in a, in a meeting and we were able to help each other. And that was a very successful model. And if we do this across teams, right, you know, it doesn't do any good to have one team completely trained up on dimensional modeling and they're experts at type two slowly changing dimensions. And then the other team just knows third normal form and another mm -hmm. team knows data vault because, you know, one's talking hubs and links, one's talking facts and dimensions and the other's talking entities and relationships. And okay, now how are they going to collaborate? Right. Right. They're not speaking the same language. Well, kind of and bring that, it back to the MMA example, too. It's kind of like one guy knows karate. The other knows, um, you know, wrestling. The other, I don't know, knows uh, Kung Fu. Kung Fu. Sure. Right. But, you know, in the in the modern world, you know, it, what works is to kind of appreciate all the above and take what, you know, I think have a standard that works, um, um, you know, maybe through combining a lot of these two. So, well, and that, that was yeah. uh, Bruce Lee's philosophy. Jeet Kune Do. Or Jeet Kune Do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, he went, he trained with masters in every discipline yeah. and, and in the end said, you know, this is what works for me personally as Bruce Lee. I can, I can use these things. Maybe, maybe Joe, you can't use the stuff from, um, from judo, right? That you're better off using Aikido and Kempo. Uh, but that part of it is, is, is figuring out what works. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, we'll back to our, our data world is organizationally. Yeah. Again, people and processes. What's going to work for our organization? What's going to help our organization achieve our goals? Of course, first off, do we know what our goals are? Oh, let's do a data mesh. I remember Claudia telling me one time she was on a flight with someone who, uh, you know, was you know, guy was reading CIO magazine sitting next to her at the plane, right? And of course, he turns her and says, "So, I, I think we need one of these. I think I need one of these Hadoop thingies, mm. right? Well, why do you think you you need Hadoop?" Well, I'm just reading all these articles that say that that's how we're going to be successful is big data and Hadoop. And, but he didn't know why he needed it other than other CIOs seem to be saying that's what you should do. And I think that's key is if people are going to look at data mesh, why do you want to do data mesh? What problems in your organization uh, do you think this will solve? Right. Um, and I do that. It, folks that are always asking me about data vault, should we do data vault or not? I say, okay, well, what are you doing today for data modeling? What are the pros and cons? You know, what's working, what's not working? What do you think uh, switching to data vault will do for you? What, what real business problem is it going to solve for you? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to be asking those questions all the time as to, you know, what problems are we trying to solve? And again, not just grasping for the next, you know, bright, shiny object. Oh, data mesh is the coolest thing, right? Okay, let's go do it. Well, why? Why are you going to go do it? Uh, it, it may be the right thing for your organization. It may not be. But that's something you need to figure out, right, before you jump in. How would you figure that out? Well, I, get, I think it's, it is that conversation of, you know, looking at, you know, you look at, I would look at, you know, the principles of data mesh. You know, what are we trying to do? You know, we're trying to eliminate, you know, fundamentally at top level, this IT bottleneck for building monolithic data warehouses and data lakes. So the first question is, do you have that bottleneck? 
hey, do you have a data warehouse? Do you have a data lake? Um, are you experiencing those problems? Okay, then let's figure out where, what is the problem there? Is it that it's a free for all and that there are no standards and maybe, you know, you might be a small organization, you really don't have a whole bunch of teams and you just aren't getting the value out of your, your data warehouse. Well, what's the root cause analysis of that? Is it, is it because there's no discipline in the approach? Mm -hmm. um, um, is, it, is, it, is it purely a tools thing that you're using outdated tools? Like you're, you're trying to do petabytes of data still on-prem and you haven't moved to the cloud yet. You need to think about doing something like, like going to Snowflake. Uh, and maybe that would, would help out. Uh, but really, before you start thinking about changing your architecture, I've done, done this in my consulting for you know, decades now. You're always looking at the as is and the to be, right? Well, do you really know what you have, right? You're, you're, have you identified, you think there's a problem. Okay, what's causing this problem? Is it because of some little thing you're doing? Is it because of some tools or is it because your team isn't functional? Okay, well, what can we do to make the team functional? Going from traditional data warehousing to data mesh is not gonna make your team more functional, right? Just because you switched any more than you know going from oracle to snowflake is suddenly going to make you more successful right right you know you've, you've got to know what problem you're trying to solve in order to in order to get there so i think that that analysis has to be done um some of the uh you know, folks that i've, I've worked with uh, via snowflake uh, roche diagnostics in switzerland is a very very successful data mesh story well they brought jamak in to consult with them on data mesh and some of the people processes stuff, how are we going to organize the teams? But then they also took uh, an incremental approach. They they as a they had a core team that they figured out how to do it and they figured out the standards basically and and built a little data domain and uh, figured out uh, a good way, figured out the tools and the platform. They decided to use Snowflake and they decided to go with data vault modeling and they they did a number of things there and then. Little by little, then they started bringing up new domain teams over time. And so their mesh is growing. It's again, like everything, it, cool. you know, don't boil the ocean, right? It's, it's not a big bang. Uh, let's take some of the concepts from agile, right? Let's, let's do it incrementally a little at a time. Uh, you know, you have to have the organizational support, right? That says the business team is now responsible for the quality of the data. And the business teams have to be in agreement that, yes, we're going to take responsibility for the data. We're not going to throw it back at IT and say, oh, yeah, our data is our data's garbage. You guys figure out how to clean it up, right? Because that's the thing that really doesn't work, right? Because you still got to tell us, well, what rules do we use to clean it up? How do you tell us that you're telling us it's bad data? Well, how do you know that it's bad data? You know, and, and what would you do to change it? And is changing it in the reporting environment really the right thing to do? Or can we go back to the operational systems? And that's, you know, my mind, your data quality feedback loop should always be going back to the operational. If it's, if garbage is coming out of the operational systems, then how are your daily reporting and your daily decisions of any value if you're now telling me that that data is garbage, right? So it loops back and back, back and forth all the time. So it's, it's all, it's all dual in the right circumstances with the right mindset, right? That we're gonna solve a problem and then figure out the most efficient way of solving that problem. And it might be data mesh and it might be data vault and it might be snowflake. It might not be any of those things. Might be data swamps. Maybe that works for you. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, probably not. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, potentially, you know, it might be, you know, maybe, maybe uh, the, Maybe Hadoop is working. Maybe it's working for you. It's just the way the data is organized, or maybe it's the way the teams are organized, right? And and the responsibility, or maybe there's just no data governance. And that's what you really need is some data yeah. governance to say, you know, these are the rules on how how and who can access the data, right? Or maybe it's just standardizing and saying, you know, uh, we're, 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 we're using DBT, we're using Matillion, we're using Informatica, we're using native SQL, we're using all these different things. Well, let's, let's trim it down a little, right? And then you don't have the, the issue of, um, you know, the, the different skill sets that you referred to earlier, Joe. It's like, you know, who, who knows what? Oh my gosh, the, the Matillion 
thing fell over. Well, the one guy who knows Matillion's on vacation. Okay, that's kind of a problem. Yeah, you can't have an agile team if you have one individual or two individuals who know very specific things that because if they're out, then everybody's offline, right? And that's a different kind of bottleneck. Matt, any thoughts? So, to what de so let me ask about Roche. I don't know if, how much you can talk about this, but but to what degree are they centralizing? So are they still trying to maintain like a centralized data warehousing layer on top of the data mesh? Or is it pretty much we provide leadership and you guys are responsible for presenting your data for everyone, to everyone else and that's it? Yeah, um, I don't know if they're doing still doing a centralized data warehouse. I don't think they are. They said their, their culture has always been very decentralized. And uh, incidentally, they're going to be talking about this at Big Data London next week in London. So anybody who happens to be in London going to Big Data London, you might want to go find a couple of the Roche sessions um, and, and listen to what they're what they're doing and how they're doing it. But in part, um, they're using Snowflake and they're using the Snowflake uh, data sharing and data marketplace features. Mm, yes. Right. So they're they're able to. And one of the rules of data mesh is you've got to the data has got to be discoverable. Right, it's got to be interoperable. Great, but if you can't find it, then it doesn't matter if it's interoperable. So uh, that's why they ended up, you know, standardizing on on Snowflake is because they had that data sharing and data marketplace features, so that the different te domain teams can produce data products, which is you know basically a curated data set, and expose it to other other departments who can then you know apply to use that data and then connect it very easily because with the snowflake data sharing it's just it's a join it just looks like another database that you have read access on and so that's what they they've done in order to be able to share data across the organization between the teams you know that's great and i mean one thing i'll say is that i think data sharing is still a, a, for most organizations a very much underappreciated capability um, I still hear people talking about APIs. I'm like, okay, APIs are great for like application integration and such. I think on the analytics side, they've proven to be kind of a disappointment. Like API integration for analytics is really, really complicated. And that was fine before we had capabilities like data sharing. But now it's like time to start adopting whether you're using BigQuery or Snowflake data sharing. Right. It's just absolutely the way to go. It makes life so much simpler. And, and we're dealing with much larger data sets than yes. what APIs were ever designed yep. for. Exactly. I, I had experience very early on back, oh, early 2000s. Uh, we were trying to, uh, had some folks that wanted to expose data via a web API. I forget what they were called at the time. It was in the Oracle world and you're using Oracle's web apps. And it was things like, in this case, it was a public school. And... Yeah, if, if you had a student ID, you could easily build something that, you know, you input a student ID and it spits out the basic demographics about that student. But if the principal wanted to review, say, all the ninth graders that were taking math, well, the API couldn't handle that. There was no way to input. You, you would have to know all the student IDs for all of those students already. Well, that kind of not what he needed he needed to be able to go and say show me all the students who are taking math and in ninth grade well that's an analytic report right and api and being able to use sql is really the only way well it's probably not the only way if you're doing machine learning you're doing data science you can use python and uh, data frames and things to do similar things right but it, it's yeah querying an api is not going to be the way to get back a multi-hundred, multi-thousand, multi-million role result set for doing something in the analytics space. And I think that's probably, you know, one of the, I think, nuances of data mesh that people sometimes miss is that data mesh is designed, is specifically to solve problems in the analytics space. It's not for right. operational data. And I know a few people have gotten off on that a couple of times. I've talked to them. They're like, oh, we're going to do this and this. We're going to use APIs. It's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> They, they missed that part. They missed that in the in the original papers. It's like, no, this is for, we're just talking about analytics. We're talking about making a better world than what we've seen in uh, the big data warehouse space and the uh, data lake space. Because we're trying to solve some of the problems some organizations have. And that's you know, as soon as you say data warehousing and data lake, you know, we're talking analytics. We're not talking operational. 
Well, and in some sense, and Joe, you've talked about this a lot. I mean, data mesh is about taking some of those operational ideas like microservices and moving them into the analytic space in a much more efficient way for data processing at scale. Yeah, and I, I think to your point about um, remote APIs, a lot of APIs do support a lot of database like query operations, right? But the real power of data sharing is that now I can take data from partner A and data from partner B and I can query two or three or, or 10 data sources at once using SQL and integrate that data as much as I want to, which is amazing. Well, and the data is updated yeah, as it you know, right. is updated and you don't do an API pagination or any of this stuff. I mean, that's a, right. for, I mean, Todd has a really good point here as he usually does. Um, and the web has definitely started thinking about uh, bulk data interop for a lot of, yes. I mean, it's definitely yeah. true. It's a shoehorning in a convenient way of getting data, but and I, was, I was actually, we were talking to uh, Jamak about this too, but it was like, you know, I think on our, uh, podcast with her um, a few months ago but you know it, she, she's right maybe there's we have to rethink sort of how we've uh, been integrating data as well uh, i think we're trying to shoehorn in tools that just aren't appropriate for what we need right now so data sharing is definitely uh right forward in this direction for sure yeah and and i know some of the, her initial writings and diagrams she was drawing analogies to microservices yeah Right. And a lot of people said, oh, OK, this is we do microservices with data. And like, no, no, I, no, that's not exactly what she meant. And I think if you if you look at it again, you have to take a, a couple of steps back and say, well, what were we trying to accomplish with microservices and how do how can we do that with data is data sharing? Does that accomplish what we're trying to accomplish? Interoperability, discoverability, uh, ease of access, but still have it governed. Right. Mm -hmm. You can still apply data masking. You can t still apply row access policies. Uh, it's not a, again, it's not going back to the data lake world, a free for all of, oh, yeah, the data is all out there. Just, you know, go grab whatever data you need. Right. That's that's not uh, what we're talking about for data mesh. Right. And because that would be just, you know, the free for all data lake world. Yeah, for sure. Got a couple of questions here from the audience. Uh, if you don't let me go through a couple of these. Um, Roger asks, um, uh, but Kent, is it even possible for people to have uh, uh, to already have implemented a true data mesh? Uh, um, he says, Jamak's books mentions a lot of it. Um, it's still emerging, and the, the tech is truly um, to build a data quantum does not exist yet. The tech to build a data quantum does not exist yet. That's what he says. Um, so, yeah, I mean, thoughts on this question here? Um, um. Well, it, it's like it's like anything. I, I think Bill Inman probably could ask the same question: Is is it actually possible to build a true data warehouse based on Bill's definition? You know, we don't. The thing I have always tried to avoid is I think that um, the theories are great, but how dogmatic do we need to be about this? And what is a true data mesh? Well, she's got her four pillars. Or principles of data mesh. It's like, are you meeting those? Then it's a data mesh. Now, maybe it's implemented in a way that she never expected, right? And that happens with yeah. every software company. Software companies, I mean, people are using Snowflake today in ways that Benoit and Thierry never envisioned. Sure. Doesn't mean it's wrong, doesn't mean it's bad. It's just, you know, end users will do whatever end users do. So, um, I think it's possible to implement a data mesh architecture using her principles with the technology that exists today. Does it meet 100% of everything she wrote in her book? Probably not. Then the question is, does it matter? Right. Right? I mean, what she's given us is thought leadership and guidelines and guideposts to what we could achieve if we put our minds to it. That's the way I look at it, right? It's, For sure. You know, what, could, what could we achieve? And so that's the questions. And, and Roche, I mean, consulted with her and then went and did it in, in Data Vault. I mean, Shamak didn't really, I don't think, knew anything about Data Vault. She knew very little about Snowflake. But yet they've taken what she taught them and implemented it, and they're, they're achieving success, right? And I think that's really the measure of success whether it's true data mesh or not, is dependent on the organization and their goals and objectives. Are they achieving their goals with data? Are they uh, reducing the time to value of the data? Are they able to do it in an agile manner? Are the individual domain teams able to expose the data to other departments easily? 
are they able to still have it governed under the appropriate privacy rules? Um, is it discoverable? You know, all of those questions, if the answer to all those questions are yes, it's wow, great, that's a success. Is it a true data mesh by definition? Maybe not. I mean, early on, Jamak said, I don't think there are any technologies out there that can actually achieve my vision today. All right. Yeah, maybe not. But how close can we get today? Is I, and I tell there's no reason to wait just because it's not all there. Yep. Can we can we get value by getting 75 percent of the way there with the tools and technologies that we have today? And I believe the answer is absolutely yes. It just does require, as we started off the conversation, discipline, right? And it requires some rules. And that's what Roche has done. And I think that's why they, they've been successful. Uh, OneWeb is another one mm -hmm. in, uh, in Europe. They've, they're, they're doing a data mesh as well on Snowflake and have been wildly successful as well. And so it is definitely doable uh, with today's technology. You know, can you do it with BigQuery? Probably. Can you do it with Azure DW? Probably. Can you, can you do it with, you know, Cloudera? Probably, I say probably to all that. If you're good enough at the technology, because the, the real question is the people and the yeah. processes, right? And how it's organized, the whole federated go governance, all that. That's, that's the thing that's really important. But it's often overlooked too, right? I mean, when data warehousing came out, I think, it, you know, I, I talked to Bill about this. It felt like initially there was some backlash to it from what he was telling me you know um like it was a uh, kind of a four-letter word for a bit and he, but he said it was a, it was like a snowball you know it just took time to you know get some success get another success and pretty soon you know that it, it's popular right but i think people got to remember that wasn't always the case you know the same data mesh reminds me a lot of data warehousing um with respect to its history and i would say um potentially some of the confusion around it as well um so yeah, absolutely. And, and in the data warehousing world evolved. I mean, I, the uh, first book that I did, I did with Bill and uh, mm. Len Silverstone, the data model resource book. And the second half of that book was all about building data warehouse models from operational models. And Bill had at that time, a great nine step process of how to take an enterprise model and convert it to a data warehouse model. Uh, and I, became an expert at it. I taught it, I wrote papers on it and I implemented it. And then we would take that data warehouse model and build star schemas on top of it, which is, you know, hysterical, of course, because so many people think it's Inman and Kimball. It's like Bill was never against star schemas, right? He was never, ever against star schemas. Um, but there was a process there. And when Dan Lindstedt then invented data vault and we got talking with Claudia and Bill about that, it's like, okay, this is another way to model data that would be effective for analytics and for the, to build an enterprise data repository uh, at a more at, at still the granular level that Bill wanted to see it with his history. It applied all of Bill's theoretical rules for what defines a data warehouse. And Bill eventually said, okay, yeah, data vault is a good way to do this in the modern data world. And so these things evolve over time and the understanding evolves over time. And I think we're going to say the same thing with data mesh because just because we're trying to solve problems in the quote unquote traditional data warehousing world doesn't mean we throw everything out, right? right? We don't need to throw out the modeling techniques. We don't need to throw out the tools. We just, we need to organize differently. We need to be more in line with the business, uh, which of course agile promoted that, right? Said so daily meetings with the stakeholders, the product owners, the business, whoever you wanted to call them. I mean, this is the same thing. You said, we're just gonna, we're pushing the responsibility back to the business, but we're going to empower them now, right? They're not just kind of a consultant to us. They're part of the team. And that's, I think we've, we've always need that. And I think everybody in IT agrees for the last 40 years. It's like IT and business need to talk to each other better, right? And data mesh is just is another way of encapsulating that concept and and emphasizing it and saying, you know, this that doing that solves these problems for your organization. And that's really what we're we're trying to do. It's interesting. Um got a couple of questions here. I'll start with the one from Mauricio. Um he asked what factors would influence the decision to move to a data mesh approach. 
sort of hit on this, but it's a bit of a, there's a bit of subtlety to this too. Yeah. I, I think it's number one is, is your current approach not working top of the line, right? Is, you know, it, is it's, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Don't care what technology you're using, what approach you're using. If you're achieving your business goals, okay, then there's no reason to look at data mesh just because data mesh is sounds cool, right? That that's the, that's the first thing, is you know, is there something that's not working right? Uh, then you look at the organization size as well. I I think I don't think data mesh is going to be applicable to very small organizations. You know, if you're an organization that's got you know one you know, a couple of data engineers and a couple of analysts, well, they can collaborate together just fine, right? They don't, you don't need to be talking about finance versus HR versus this domain versus that domain when that's the size of your organization. Um, are you, if you're globally distributed, on the other hand, and you have teams all over the world, okay, then data mesh might make a lot more sense because of the geographic differences and the time zone differences. And if that, if that has been a problem for being successful, and I'm always going to come back to, you know, is it a problem? You know, the mm. factors you need to look at is where are your problems? Where are your bottlenecks? And uh, can you reorganize in a way that actually solves those problems without creating other problems? That's interesting. Why do we get it backwards so often? Why, why is it that we try and uh, try and uh, you know start with the uh, the end in mind to quote Stephen Covey? But you know, um, um, and that, that always seems like to me, uh, data mesh. It seems like a you know it, it's great. It also seems like a utopian ideal, um, which maybe is part of the point. Uh, maybe it, it, it isn't the destination. It's more of the journey to get there. Um, just like yeah. in, in martial arts, for example, you know, a black belt is not really a, for some. It's a destination, but, but for others, it's um it doesn't stop right right yeah it, it, it is a it's a continuing evolution and that is certainly over the years of my doing taekwondo found out you know so many parents in particular you know the, the their kid makes first degree black belt and all of a sudden they disappear and you call them it's like well why aren't they coming well they got their black belt they're done right and it's like hello uh me instructor fifth degree, <laughs> the time i'm fifth degree black belt your your child is a first degree black belt they just got their first level of black belt and you get, Oh, I didn't realize there were more levels. Right. Right. And it's, yeah, it's, it isn't a destination. It's like, well, I just wanted my kid to get a black belt. We're good. We're going to go play soccer now. Right. And, and there's just so much more that could be there. And I, you're right. The, the, in the data world, there, there is, and uh, we talk about what maturity matrix, right? Everybody, everything has a maturity matrix or a maturity curve. And it's, it's very true. And there's probably the same for, for data mesh. You know, what's your data management maturity, you know, and where do you need to be is, you know, is, is, uh, you know, having uh, a couple little data marts basically solve the problem for your company and you're good. Or is it more complex? Is it changing? Do we need, uh, need to be more agile? All of those questions come up as to whether or not should we be looking at data mesh, right? I, I think part of it too is that it's there's this human tendency to look for magic bullets, right? Um, hard work remains hard work, regardless of whether you have to be working on traditional data warehousing or data mesh. And so it's always easier to like reach for that shiny object. And so back in the dupe days, it was like, oh, Google's doing this, Yahoo's doing this. Therefore, if I just imitate them and do this really cool thing, this magic bullet, then I'm going to be really, really successful. Completely ignoring the fact that Google did this because because of their success, right? It was more a consequence of their success than a cause. Yes, it helped them to keep scaling, but a lot of companies adopting Hadoop just didn't didn't have those problems, had a bunch of other problems they should have been addressing instead. Yeah, and I had a, a CIO that I worked with, you know, a couple decades ago. We went through that same thing as they, the question, we were using HP and HP UX and, and Oracle on that, and they were looking at, you know, should we go to Linux? And I said, well, why? Well, you know, it's open source and, Amazon is using it. And I happen to, I found a white paper that talked about what Amazon was doing in order to make their, you know, Amazon website go so fast for all the purchases. Cause at that point it was just amazon.com basically. And it was like, okay, they've got 900 servers. They've got 30 or 40 Stanford PhDs 
modifying the kernel code in order to make it work. And every month they are replacing tens of servers because it's always aging out. And I, I had to go back and he's like, well, how are they making it work so fast? And it's like, they have this many servers. Uh, they have this many people with PhDs from Stanford and that's how they're making it work. And they're not using out of the box Linux. And he went, oh, and I said, I don't think we're going to be able to fund it to that level to get better results than what we're getting today with HP and HP support was great. Our system administrators knew it inside and out. He's like, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll, we'll stay where we are. But it was that it was the, the bright, shiny object thing is like, hey, saw something in CIO magazine about open source and Linux. And, you know, maybe that would be cheaper for us if we drop the proprietary HP UX. It's like, yeah, you got to balance it all out. But uh, we do have that. And I think uh, with data mesh, we ha have a lot of people talking about that. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think uh, we're seeing and one of the things that uh, I think some of Shamak's comments have been to this is just like with data warehousing, and Bill will talk to you about this as well, um, vendors are picking up the data mesh mm -hmm. terminology. And that's, what we ha that's where we've got to be really careful as decision makers and saying, you know, just because, you know, no, no tool or technology is data mesh, right? Data mesh is a concept. It's an architecture. Maybe you would call it a framework. And there, you're not going to have one tool. One vendor is not going to be your data mesh solution. They may, we can switch over and start talking about data fabric. It may be part of the data fabric that you use in your data mesh solution, but they're not a data mesh tool. Can you use, you know, can you use Snowflake to help implement a data mesh? Yes. Can you use Matillion? Yes. Can you use DBT? Yes. Can you use Coalesce? Yes. Can you use Data Ops? Yes. All these things, you can use these tools to help build your, what I still will call an enterprise data platform using a data mesh approach. But none of those vendors are data mesh vendors. And that's where it gets scary is when the executive level goes looking for a data mesh vendor in a tool to solve a problem and say, oh, well, we just need to implement this tool and we've solved the problem. No, it's still always going to go back to people and processes again. Yeah, and I think it's important to say, too, I mean, I think we're fond of saying that it's not only technology. Technology is extremely helpful in implementation, right? Like the whole data sharing thing. If you don't have that robust data sharing layer with really strong security controls, it's going to be way, way harder to implement data mesh. But yeah, the technology on its own it isn't going to do it for you. It's mostly about the people. Well, it's going to start causing confusion just yeah. like it did with data warehousing, right? Where now you're confusing the... Um, you know, the idea with the technology and more importantly, the vendor, which is what the vendor wants. Obviously, they want to get the mind share for that particular idea. I know of, um, you know, some, you know, some books coming out uh, that might irk certain founders of the data mesh, like the, uh, there's a book on like the streaming data mesh or something like that. Or, uh, um, yeah, I'm not going to say more, but. Yeah, yeah, no, I know, I know Bill, <laughs> Bill certainly had those challenges as well with the data warehouse and the use of oh, the yeah. term data warehouse by various vendors and consultancies that just flew in the face of what he was trying to say mm -hmm. and accomplish. And, and uh, I'm sure uh, Jamak is uh, experiencing that already. Yeah, <laughs> I think there's a lot of parallels. I yeah. sympathize with both. So Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, it's, but I, that's just seems to be a propensity. Again, I think it's to the yeah. point is the technology people get given a problem and they're, they're looking for a single tool solution to the problem. And the, I'll say, executives that have not been educated, you know, hear the word in passing, hear a couple of chats about it and say, oh, hey, Roche is doing data mesh. Well, we should do data mesh, right? without really understanding the ramifications and saying, so what, what tool do we need to do? Well, you know, and what tools are, are Roche, is Roche using? Not that their architecture is not a good starting point to look at, but it isn't one tool. And it's not, you know, tell your IT people to go buy these tools and then they can build a data mesh. Any more than you can say, thou art agile, which right. was places where that happens. Like, oh, we're, we're gonna go to an agile methodology. Great, so when do we go to training? Oh, you, no training. You just need to start delivering stuff in two weeks. 
That's pretty funny. It, it does remind me a lot of, um, you know, I, I think the term that it's been most abused in the 2010s has been uh, AI. Yeah. So, um, you know, that that when it came out, I mean, that, that well, it came out a long time ago, but it had a very sp specific meaning. But then you start seeing AI was in everything. And when you look under the hood, it was basically um, addition and subtraction. You could call that AI, I suppose, too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I got this abused um, to the point where I, I don't even know what it, it means in the modern context, especially when you're talking about tools. So, yeah. 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 And as again, yeah, I had a friend who always said a, uh, a bad architect with a good tool is still a bad architect. Mm. Right. Yep. <laughs> the tool does not solve the problem. It is the approach and the people and how the tool is used. And that'll get me, you know, back around to, uh, say, you know, if you're going to do data mesh, you need to look at data modeling. I mean, you just, yeah. you, you've got to start at the business level of modeling too. You know, is what does the data mean from a business perspective before you worry about how many tables and columns and foreign keys are we going to have, right? Um, you know, we, we talked about this before the show. You know, there's a lot going on in the industry where people seem to conflate technical database design with data modeling. It's a form of data modeling. We'll call it physical modeling. But for solving something at a large organization level, if you're going to have interoperability, you have to have agreed upon terms and definitions of, you know, for lack of a better term, we'll use it. The old days, we called them entities. So what is a customer? You know, what attributes belong to a customer? You know, what kind of uh, data are we going to ultimately expose? And do we all agree on the definition of what that is? Uh, do we all agree on the definition of profit? Do we agree on net profit versus gross profit? And, and building that conceptual level model with definitions from a business perspective first. You know, just taking a bunch of raw data and throwing it in a database and exposing it and calling it a data product. Well, okay, that's... Uh, you know, technically you did something and maybe some of that's useful to someone, but is it scalable? Is it uh, extensible? Is it going to be robust over the long term? If what you exposed, nobody understands the meaning of that data. Um, and I think, again, back to the data lake, data swamp world, we saw a lot of that where loaded a whole bunch of files in. And what do we say? Data scientists were spending 80% of their time, you know, transforming, cleansing, basically understanding the data before you, you can't build a machine learning algorithm if you don't understand the data you're feeding in, right? And what the definitions are. So it's really important to have that, that level of understanding. And to me, that's, that's a data model. That is a model of the data. Uh, is it always in a diagram? A lot of people like diagrams. So, you know, th those are useful, but at least having what we used to call a data dictionary. Now you call it a data catalog, right? What's a data catalog? It's the, the, the business terms and definitions of the data that's available for analysis. And if you're going to do interoperability and do a data mesh, you're going to need that. So why not start with that, right? And then, you know, look at the, the, the technical data that you're pulling out of your operational system and saying, what, what format do we put it in uh, to expose it to other domains? You know, again, those are all those are all models and all varying degrees of models, different levels, conceptual, logical, physical. It's not just one thing, but it is important because it is the means by which we communicate. That's awesome. Well, cool. It looks like we're coming up on time. Um, Kent, uh, thanks for being on the show. I'd love to have you back on sometime. I feel like we can probably talk for hours about this and uh Maybe Absolutely. Over, maybe over a beer or something. We will someday. So um, you're going <laughs> to be in a yeah. Any, anything you want to want to promote? Uh, you mentioned Big Data London. Are you going to be out there for that? No, I, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make it to Big Data London. But uh, a couple of companies that I work with, uh, Data Ops Live and SQL DBM Data Modeling Tool, nice, are, are going to be there. So and of course, Snowflake's a platinum sponsor. And I don't work for Snowflake anymore, but I am a shareholder. So, well, <laughs> and I'm still same. a fanboy, right? You know, you don't, you don't, you don't go from. Uh, it's going to be hard for somebody to convert me away from Snowflake. I mean, they, Snowflake converted me away from Oracle, but I still think Oracle is great for for certain things. But for what Snowflake does and for analytics, 
I, I think it's the, the best tool on the planet. But they'll all be there. Uh, lots of knowledgeable people. Folks from Roche will be there and OneWeb will be there. So if you want to talk to people about data mesh, um, find the dataops.live booth because nice. uh, that's where those folks will be will be hanging out. That's cool. Yeah, I wanted to get out there uh, next week. I know Chris Tab. He was trying to get me to. Yes, uh, Chris is going to be there. Yeah. Yeah, fly out, but I uh, won't be able to make it unfortunately. But um, but next time. But um, Chris will be there, so people. Chris can will go. be there. Yes, if you want to talk data modeling? Chris. Find Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, cool. On the uh, ternary data end of things, uh, tonight at uh, seven p.m. Mountain Time. Actually, we're going to be on the uh, Seattle Data Guys uh, YouTube show. Um, talking about whatever Seattle Data Guy wants to talk about. So that'll be pretty fun. Uh, go check that out. Uh, that looks like a fun time. Um, next week in the Monday Morning Data Chat, we have uh, Keith McCormick. He's going to be on the show. Um, and then I'm going to be in Australia um, for a, what was it? Data Engine Bytes, a data engineering conference in Melbourne and Sydney. So uh, get your tickets for that. And after that, um, back in the States, we'll be at Data Driven NYC October 11th, uh, Matt Turk's uh meet up in um, new york so that's gonna be really cool to go check out and lots of uh guests coming up on the show so yeah thanks to the audience um great uh questions um about 103 comments on here so that's pretty good so anyway kent um as always uh, good to talk to you and hope to hope to see you again so all right thanks, thanks for everybody. having me on guys uh, yeah anytime thank you all right see you. Bye.